Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series are productions of the Omohundro Institute. The Redcoats! The Redcoats are marching! The regulars are coming out! Turn out! I think the American Revolution is certainly a transformative moment in which a place goes from being a colony with competing empires, indigenous and British, to an independent nation with many competing nations within it, being separate. The American Revolution, well... Obviously, it is the founding moment of the United States, and that's a really important part of it. And I think the founding of the United States is itself revolutionary. But the American Revolution also marks a new moment in popular government. And so it's also about allowing new people into the story of how we're going to govern ourselves. You know, there have been histories of the revolution from the time the revolution happened, and they've been going on ever since. Welcome to episode 166 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. The mission of the Doing History to the Revolution series has been to explore not just the history of the revolution, but the histories of the revolution. To fulfill this mission, we explored well-known events from different perspectives. Events like the Boston Tea Party, Paul Revere's Ride, and the drafting of the Declaration of Independence. And as we explored these events, we asked ourselves, what do we really know about these events, and why do we know what we know about them? These questions led us to investigate our sources of information. We examined both the primary historical sources, the people who lived through and participated in the revolution left behind for us, and the secondary historical sources, the history books that have been written and rewritten by historians since the Revolution's War came to an end in the late 18th century. And these investigations, our exploration of our sources of information, led us to better understand how the way we understand the Revolution, by interpreting and contextualizing these sources, has changed over time. Plus, throughout the 19 episodes we've posted in this series, we asked a lot of the same questions the revolutionaries asked themselves. What was the American Revolution? What caused the Revolution? Who was the Revolution for? And How do and how should we remember the revolution? We can see the revolution in its full context as we never did before. And we can see the boundaries of it, the limits of what the people could do. And therefore, it does have a kind of tragic quality to it, not sad. It isn't a sad phase, but it does show the limits of their possibilities, because we can certainly describe their circumstances in a way we never had before. And that's the stage we're at now. It's at least two revolutions, maybe more. Today, in our 20th and final series episode, we're going to ask and explore answers to one last critical ongoing question. If the American Revolution was about establishing liberty and freedom throughout the 13 British North American colonies turned states, how did the people who lived during and not long after the revolution understand and conceive of the liberty and freedom the revolution established? Who was this liberty and freedom for? And what did this liberty and freedom mean? When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. On the cusp of the revolution's bicentennial in 1975, Historian Edmund Morgan published American Slavery, American Freedom, The Ordeal of Colonial Virginia. In his book, Morgan asked how Virginians, who stood in the vanguard of the revolution and supplied three of the United States' first four presidents, could have also been slaveholders and ardent defenders of slavery. Many, many generations of Americans have been asking themselves questions about what Morgan called the central paradox of America. The Declaration of Independence described all men as created equal when its authors knew that they weren't. So was the revolutionary idea of freedom, in fact, dependent on slavery? Today, we return to the place where our series began, the world of Paul Revere. We're going to speak with Christopher Cameron, an associate professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, who will introduce us to revolutionary men and women who grappled with the same paradox about American freedom that Morgan and so many other Americans have contemplated over the years. Phyllis Wheatley, Caesar Sarter, and many others will help us see what the American Revolution looked like through the fight to end slavery. Our guest is an associate professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. He's the founder of the African American Intellectual History Society which, with its blog, Black Perspectives, reaches tens of thousands of researchers and readers each year. Plus, he's the author of To Plead Our Own Cause, African Americans in Massachusetts and the Making of the Anti-Slavery Movement, and the co-editor of the forthcoming book, New Perspectives on the Black Intellectual Tradition. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Christopher Cameron. Thank you for having me, Liz. Now, Christopher, early on in the Doing History to the Revolution series, we explored the creation of the Declaration of Independence. So we know from our investigation that its most famous claim, all men are created equal, was penned and approved of by men, many of whom held others in bondage. Yet, even with this knowledge, we still associate the idea of freedom so powerfully with the revolution and the founding fathers' ideas. Therefore, we wonder if you would help us explore and expand our ideas about freedom in the revolution by helping us think about how they came together in Massachusetts for African Americans. Would you start by telling us about African-American communities in 18th century New England and in Massachusetts specifically? It's actually a little difficult to talk specifically about African-American communities for most of the 18th century in Massachusetts and in New England more broadly. So Africans created communities for themselves within particular spaces, such as congregational churches for the first 60 to 70 years of the 18th century. But there were so few Black people in New England and in Massachusetts that it's hard to look at particular neighborhoods, for example, and say that's where the Black community resided. In Massachusetts, the proportion of Black people in the population never rose above 5% prior to the revolution, although it was higher in urban areas such as Boston. And nearly all Blacks in the colonies were enslaved, residing in households with perhaps one or two other slaves. What we do know is that from the early years of settlement in Massachusetts through the Revolutionary Era, African slaves occupied a variety of positions in the colonial economy. Initially, they helped to develop the economic infrastructure by doing things such as clearing the land, breaking up soil, building docks, making roads. Even though there was never as great a number of slaves in New England as you see in southern colonies, slaves did have fairly tough life in Massachusetts and in New England. They generally had to work at least 12 hours a day. The same sort of Puritan work ethic that drove individual farmers was kind of expected of their slaves. In the course of my research, I've even found examples of masters offering to give away the children of slaves. Of course, in Southern colonies, slaves were encouraged to have children, but in New England colonies, masters often did not want to have more than one or two slaves in their household. So until the era of the American Revolution, most residents in Massachusetts earned their living by farming. So masters made slaves in agricultural work, 
but slaves were also domestic workers, and in the coastal regions, a number of blacks worked in the shipping industry, either aboard ships or as ship joiners, carpenters, and rope makers. Others worked as blacksmiths, caulkers, bakers, shoemakers, and in a number of other trades. When we do start to see the sort of rise and growth of actual Black communities is actually after the American Revolution, right? So this is when slaves in Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts are gaining their freedom. And that's when you start to get the sort of coherent Black communities forming, especially around institutions such as the African Masonic Lodge created in 1775 and the African Baptist Church which was founded in the early 19th century. Okay, so before we get into specific examples that highlight the fact that Boston and Massachusetts emerged as centers of African-American anti-slavery thought and the anti-slavery movement itself, I wonder if you would tell us why these areas emerged as centers for these ideas and activities. Well, I think partially because of the concentration of slaves that you see in Boston that wasn't present in other locales throughout New England. So while Massachusetts in general had only 5% slave population, Boston had a population of slaves that was roughly 10 to 12% of the population. So you have a bit greater concentration of slaves there. And it was also a city that drew a number of revivalist preachers during the Great Awakening especially George Whitfield. And if you look at church records from the 1740s up through the 1770s, you see a number of African Americans kind of joining these congregational churches. So where you don't see concentrated Black communities present throughout other New England colonies or even in Western Massachusetts, you start to get a little bit more of a concentrated Black community in Boston at least on Sundays when people are coming together in churches. And in church records, you can actually see that these churches serve as kind of political spaces. They serve as educational spaces. In the minutes of the Old South Church, some of the leaders were actually complaining about slaves that remained in the meeting house after Sunday services, right? So you got to wonder, well, what exactly are they doing there? Is this the place where they're drafting their petitions, right? Is Phyllis Wheatley, who joined the Old South Church in 1771, is she maybe teaching other people how to read? Did she have a hand in that 1773 petition? So Black presence within these various congregational churches kind of served to bring them together and I think provided a foundation for political activity that simply wasn't present in other locales throughout the colony and throughout New England. You just mentioned that many Black people in Boston gathered together in churches, that they used churches for educational and political purposes, and that many revivalist preachers passed through Boston, and that these are all reasons why Boston emerged as a center for African-American anti-slavery thought and for the anti-slavery movement. So it seems like we should really talk about religion. Now, In your work, you've argued that there's a bit of a contradiction in the way that scholars have viewed the role that revivalism played in the American Revolution. So I wonder if you would tell us about the Great Awakening and why some scholars seem to think that it could have informed ideas of the revolution. The Great Awakening was an intercolonial revival movement that spanned the decades from the 1730s to the 1760s. Most scholars date its origins to a revival that occurred in Jonathan Edwards' congregation in Northampton, Massachusetts, during the winter of 1734 and 1735. Now, Edwards had essentially been prepped for the ministry from his early childhood. So his father actually began instructing him in Latin before the age of seven years old. And his personal narrative of the 1740s dates his interest in religion back to the age of nine, when there was a spiritual awakening in his father's congregation. Edwards entered Yale College in 1716 at the ripe age of 13 years old to further his academic training for the ministry. A decade later, Edwards was asked to go to Northampton to assist his aging grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, in his pastorate. And this began his career in Western Massachusetts. Now, just three years later, Goddard passed away, leaving the 26-year-old Edwards 
in charge of the congregation. And Edwards immediately picked up where his grandfather had left off, working to produce revivals of religion that could sort of reform and re-energize the community. The first of these revivals began in December of 1734. Earlier in the year, a young parishioner and his congregation had suddenly passed away, and this served to convict some of the other young people and sort of make them more concerned for their spiritual state. Edwards' kind of hellfire and brimstone preaching certainly helped matters, and by December, he had seen a number of new converts in his own church. And these conversions had an effect on visitors to Northampton and sort of served to spread revivals throughout the Connecticut River Valley, with Edwards claiming that over 32 communities from Northfield, Mass. to New Haven, Connecticut, had experienced awakenings. So in the following decades, revivals would spread throughout New England, the Middle Colonies, and would reach the Southern Colonies by the 1750s. They were characterized by itinerant preaching, such as that carried out by George Whitfield and Gilbert Tennant, whereby pastors would travel from congregation to congregation preaching the gospel. And the revivals were also characterized by a more emotive form of religion that included shrieking, fainting, yelling, crying when people kind of came to the realization that they were saved, similar today to what we see in evangelical churches when people feel that they caught the Holy Spirit, right? Now, in New England, the stress on a converted ministry by revivalists and this practice of a more emotive form of religion had the effect of kind of splitting established churches into new lights and old lights. The new lights were led by figures such as Jonathan Edwards and James Davenport, while the old lights were primarily those in the eastern part of Massachusetts, like Boston minister Charles Chauncey, or those who ran Yale College, such as Ezra Stiles. New lights challenged the authority of Orthodox ministers engaging in polemical wars, leading splits from established churches. And the Great Awakening also changed ministerial education as new ministers such as Samuel Hopkins, a Yale graduate of 1741, would end up going to study with revival ministers like Edwards in what came to be known as schools of the prophets. Now, in terms of the Great Awakening's effect on the American Revolution, religious disputes and church schisms prepared colonists for protests against Great Britain. Many of these religious disputes were actually over taxation, just like later conflicts with Britain would be, because churches, of course, were supported by the government. Also, New Light churches became a primary method by which revolutionaries could disseminate political ideology. And you definitely see an uptick in political sermons in the years following the Great Awakening. Additionally, the ideas of the Great Awakening and figures like Edwards played a prominent role in revolutionary ideology. For example, Jonathan Edwards emphasized the necessity of living under a free government in order to practice virtue. So when colonists felt that they were living under a tyrannical government, it became not only a political duty to oppose Great Britain, but a religious duty as well. Now, how did the Great Awakening and its ideas influence the anti-slavery movements that came during and after the revolution? Well, the last idea of Jonathan Edwards I mentioned, namely his argument that freedom was a requirement for virtuous behavior, cropped up in a number of different Black abolitionist arguments during the revolutionary era. For example, in January of 1773, Blacks in Boston submitted a petition to Governor Thomas Hutchinson and the General Court calling for the end of slavery. The petition began by noting that they desired to bless God who loves mankind and who sent his son to die for their salvation and that this God is no respecter of persons. So their words kind of put forth a biblical basis of Black protest against the institution of slavery and was a shrewd use of some of the same language that white colonists and ministers employed in their arguments for colonial freedom from British tyranny. And the slaves were also making their case for racial equality by saying that God does not judge people based on outward experiences, 
but what is in their heart. And that was sort of a central tenet of the Great Awakening. Now, these petitioners also argued that slavery was harmful to all forms of virtue except for patience. So in making this claim, right, that slavery is destructive to the virtue of those in bondage, they used an idea common in the political discourse of the time. So while white colonists were not themselves enslaved, many political tracts and speeches discussed parliamentary taxation as a form of slavery, right? And ministers throughout the colony remarked on the destructiveness of any form of slavery to the virtue of a people. So this was the idea that Edwards had articulated in his work, where he defined liberty as the freedom to act morally without any constraint. The Calvinist ministry during the revolution used Edwards' idea to argue that men must have natural liberty if they were to be able to do the will of God. And the petitioner's rhetoric indicates that they too felt liberty was necessary for virtue. So by pointing this out, they could sort of gain allies among the ministerial class that were making similar claims. The Great Awakening likewise played a key role in abolitionism during the revolutionary era, a moment where a number of African Americans in Massachusetts converted to Christianity, and it also provided a means to create community among a largely dispersed and isolated slave population. So from the 1740s to the 1770s, hundreds of African Americans were baptized and joined congregations such as the Old South Church, Brattle Street Church, and the First and Second Congregational Churches. So within these spaces, Blacks became familiar with the language of Calvinist theology, including ideas of God's divine providence. And as we can see from the petitions of the 1770s, Black anti-slavery activists were able to use Calvinist language and religious ideas to great effect, basically transforming that for much of the 18th century had compromised with slavery into a powerful message of abolition. We've just had an overview of how religion informed ideas of the American Revolution and of the early anti-slavery movement. So now we should really explore the anti-slavery ideas of individual African Americans. And to plead our own cause, Christopher describes Phyllis Wheatley, Caesar Sarter, and Lemuel Haynes as being very important for the ideas that they expressed and for the ways that their ideas reach beyond their own communities. So I think we should begin with Phyllis Wheatley. Christopher, would you tell us who Wheatley was and how her writing about slavery reflected her religious views? Phyllis Wheatley was born in West Africa in 1753, probably between the present day countries of Ghana and Gambia. When she was about seven or eight years old, she was captured and brought to America aboard the slave ship Phyllis. Wheatley was among the 75 slaves on the ship when it landed in Boston in 1761. And it was there that John Wheatley, a prominent businessman, purchased her. Wheatley's life was not the typical slave experience, even for an urban slave, as her owners recognized her precociousness and encouraged her education by giving her few household chores to perform. She turned out to be something of a prodigy, acquiring a mastery of English in a little over a year, and according to her master, also learning to read the most difficult parts of the Bible in short order. Wheatley was baptized in Old South Church in 1771, and her piety combined with her learning really helped to endear her to some of the more important religious and literary figures of her day, including individuals such as Mather Biles and Samuel Cooper, who was actually the minister who baptized Wheatley while visiting from his own congregation. So these connections would prove important in helping to get her published and in shaping her religious and political ideology. Now, the work that Wheatley is most well known for is her 1773 book of poems, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. With this work, Wheatley became the first woman and the first African American to publish a book in what would become the United States. The poem that's most cited from the work and that I argue best captures some of her religious ideas was one she had written in 1768 entitled on being brought from Africa to America. It's a pretty short poem. Here she wrote, 
Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too, once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is a diabolic dye. Remember Christians, Negroes black as cane may be refined and join the angelic train. So in the first half of this poem, Wheatley employed a few Calvinist ideas, specifically the theological ideas that Samuel Hopkins articulated in works such as The Nature of True Holiness. Hopkins was a leading proponent of the new divinity, which was sort of a theological school influenced by the ideas of Jonathan Edwards. And in one of his kind of central notions was his doctrine of disinterested benevolence, where he required from individuals kind of complete self-denial, even to the point of being willing to be damned for God's glory. Now, this doctrine for Hopkins articulated an answer to the problem of evil, positing that God allows suffering to promote greater good. And it was this latter idea that Wheatley spoke to in the first half of their poem, right? "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land. She's claiming that it was due to God's mercy that she was enslaved, as this eventually allowed her to become a Christian. So she's not apologizing for slavery, as her words might seemingly suggest, and as she's been criticized for by some scholars. But what she's really doing is articulating her belief that under all circumstances, God has the ability to bring good out of evil. And then you see in the second half of the poem, she switches gears and directly attacks ideas of racial inequality by arguing that blacks were just as eligible for salvation as whites and thus should not be seen as inferior. And I argue that Wheatley's poetry also evinced the influence of Puritan covenant theology, the school of being during the 17th century when Puritan leaders such as John Winthrop were trying to explain the relationship of New England to God. So in a later poem published in 1778 on the death of General Wooster, she subtly employed covenant theology to argue against slavery when she asks, how presumptuous shall we hope to find divine acceptance with the almighty mind while yet, O oh, deed ungenerous, they disgrace and hold in bondage Africa's blameless race. So in these few lines, Wheatley argued that America would not be successful in the Revolutionary War if it continued to enslave Blacks because this practice was immoral, and it was also a breach of New England's covenant with God. And what about Caesar Sartre? Who was he and how did he combine religion and some of the rhetoric and political ideas from the revolution to express other new anti-slavery ideas? Caesar Sartre was a free black man who had been born in Africa and spent 20 years enslaved in Massachusetts. We actually don't know very much about his life besides some sparse details he included in a 1774 essay he wrote for the Essex Journal and Merrimack Packet, which was a newspaper located in Newburyport, Massachusetts. It's likely that he lived in Newburyport or very close by. Newburyport was a relatively new town of 3,600 people located about 40 miles north of Boston. Ten miles before it split from Newbury, Massachusetts in 1764, there were 50 slaves in the town. However, we don't have the census records to indicate how many there were a decade later when Sartre published his essay. Now, given that Newburyport is located on the coast, Sartre may have been a maritime worker, perhaps working as a sailor, carpenter, or rope maker, or he could have been a skilled worker in any number of trades in which Black people worked, such as blacksmithing or cutting hair. The essay that Sartre wrote in 1774 is his only known publication, and it demonstrates both the influence of Calvinism and the political context of the American Revolution on Black anti-slavery thought. And his essay is also one of the most forceful early Black critiques of the revolutionary tradition. So he begins the piece by referencing the context of the revolution, noting that because colonists were fighting hard for their natural rights and privileges as free men, they should know well that liberty is the greatest gift a person can enjoy. And as political writers in revolutionary Massachusetts, such as John Adams, often 
kind of reference the settling of the colony and the fact that early Puritans came to Massachusetts to enjoy liberty, Sartre also connected Black struggles in the 1770s for liberty with the early Puritans. Along with his appeal to the heritage of New Englanders, Sartre spoke to covenant theology in his essay. If his readers could imagine what these slaves went through, he asked how supporters of slavery or slaveholders would hope to escape divine judgment. Prefiguring Black liberation theology in the 20th century, he told his readers that if they continue to practice a hypocritical institution such as slavery, they would surely face the wrath of God because a God would always be on the side of the oppressed. And after this, he started to sort of build an argument for the irrationality of slavery among people who sought freedom for themselves, noting that if the colonists hoped to be able to preserve their own liberty, the first step would be to free their slaves. Only then would God sort of look favorably on their cause. So in making this argument that God would not assist the colonists in their struggle against Britain, Sartre sort of kind of like Wheatley helped to broaden covenant theology to speak to the problem of slavery. Now, like Caesar Sartre, Lemuel Haynes also combined religion and some of the revolution's rhetoric and political ideas to express new ideas about slavery. He argued that it was natural for black people, like all people, to want to fight for their freedom. Christopher, would you tell us about Haynes's sermon, Liberty Further Extended? What were the implications of this sermon and the ideas it contained? Well, just as Caesar Sartre did, Lemuel Haynes drew from Calvinist thought and the revolutionary tradition in critiquing the institution of slavery. So Haynes was actually born the same year as Phyllis Wheatley in 1753. He was the illegitimate child of a white mother and black father. He spent his early years as an indentured servant on a farm in Granville, Massachusetts until 1774, when a number of young men of his generation, he joined the militia, marched to Lexington, and he later served with the Continental Army in Roxbury, Massachusetts, and at Ticonderoga. Haynes was self-educated, often reading whatever he could get his hands on after working on the farm, and his education led him to dabble first in poetry and then to compose this anti-slavery essay, Liberty, and later to write and give sermons. He received theological training after his participation in the war ended in 1776, and he would go on to become the first ordained Black minister in America and the first to preside over a primarily white congregation. Now, Haynes' sermon, Liberty Further Extended, was among the first to use the rhetoric of the Declaration of Independence. He prefaced the sermon with the first sentence of the second paragraph of the Declaration, which posits that all men have natural inalienable rights. And he gave as his reason for writing the piece the recognition that while colonists were engaged in the struggle against the tyranny of Great Britain, they were involved in similarly tyrannical practices themselves. Haynes then went on to discuss drawing from the political context of Massachusetts as well as his knowledge of the Bible. So he noted that liberty is an innate principle. So if a man infringes upon another man's liberty, he must expect to meet resistance as the laws of nature call for all men to defend their liberty. So here Haynes argued in no uncertain terms that like the white revolutionaries, it is in the very nature of black people to fight for their liberty. And they would do so if whites continue to deprive them of that precious gift. Haynes also argued that liberty is a gift from God and that only God has the right to take it away. So here he is drawing from his Calvinist background, arguing basically for the absolute sovereignty of God in this matter of liberty, and noting that any man's attempt to take it away was sort of acting out of their domain. Now, Haynes' sermon was not published during his lifetime, Yet, I still believe it is important for our understanding of American abolitionism. So, the sermon demonstrates the degree to which Calvinism in particular and Christianity in general informed African American political thought in Massachusetts and throughout New England. Additionally, Haynes would not have kept these ideas to himself. So, even if he didn't publish the sermon, he likely circulated it 
among, you know, his friends and family. And we know that he later published works and spoke about the institution of slavery from the pulpit on many occasions. Now, after his service in the Revolutionary War, Haynes studied theology and was ordained as a congregational minister, taking up the pastorship of a congregational church in Rutland, Vermont in 1788, where he worked until 1818. So from that position, Haynes would use the ideas and rhetoric shaped by his early experiences to continue to critique the institution of slavery, arguing that Christianity and republicanism were inconsistent with holding human beings in bondage. I'd like for us to talk about and explore the life of one more early African-American thinker whose ideas about freedom, liberty, and slavery had a big impact on the early anti-slavery movement. But before we talk about that person, Karen Wolf, the director of the Omohundro Institute, would like to say something about why the Institute has produced this series and why it thinks our explorations of early American history are so important. Thanks, Liz. The Omohundro Institute is so proud of the Doing History to the Revolution series and the work that it reflects. We know that history is the context for every decision we make in our lives, whether those are individual or collective ones. And how we understand where we are now shapes what we think we can or should do next. History is compelling, and as we agree, it's just utterly fascinating. But it's also complex, and it's not something we can necessarily easily access. It takes research and narration, and over time, collaboration and debate may shift what we think or uncover new information. This series has helped to show us how that happens through an icon of American history, the Revolution. We hope all of you who have listened, discussed, and taught the Doing History to the Revolution series will continue to share it with your friends and family, and the Omohundro Institute will keep doing history. We're looking forward to telling you more about that in the new year. Thanks, Karen. Now, in his book, To Plead Our Own Cause, Christopher begins the introduction by talking about another early African-American anti-slavery thought leader, David Walker. Christopher notes how scholars often describe Walker's 1829 appeal to the colored citizens of the world as one of the first radical anti-slavery texts authored by an African-American. Christopher, would you tell us who David Walker was and about his famous appeal? Certainly. Walker was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, to a free mother and enslaved father around 1796. He spent some time in Charleston during the early 1820s, and the historian Peter Hanks argues that he was likely present when Denmark Vesey planned his 1822 conspiracy which was centered in Charleston's African Methodist Episcopal Church. By 1825, Walker was living in Boston, where he joined the African Masonic Lodge and became a member of May Street Methodist Church, which was an independent Black congregation formed in 1818 and headed by Samuel Snowden. In 1826, Walker helped to found the Massachusetts General Colored Association, This was an anti-slavery organization that gained a national reputation for advocating the immediate emancipation of Southern slaves, opposing the colonization movement, and working to create unity among Northern free Blacks. Walker published his appeal to the colored citizens of the world in 1829 and built upon some of the themes that he had developed in a speech to the Massachusetts General Colored Association in 1828 particularly by calling for Black unity and self-help. He began the appeal with the premise that African Americans were what he called the most degraded, wretched, and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began. And he stated that his purpose was basically to awaken a spirit of inquiry and investigation among the Black population in the American Republic. So his appeal was about educating the Black community and motivating them to do something about their situation in both the United States and throughout the diaspora. Walker also stated that Blacks' degraded condition in America owed to ignorance. So he called for Black leaders to help educate their brethren. Ignorance, he said, caused both violence and disunity in the slave community and also caused Blacks to have an irrational fear of white people so that He said eight whites could effectively control 50 blacks. The solution to this problem, in his view, was self-help and a stronger sense of community among African-Americans, both slave and free. So he implored black leaders to aim for increased educational standards in the community, especially for the youth. As black abolitionists in Massachusetts had argued since the 1780s, 
Walker believed that increased educational opportunity was one of the best means to fight against slavery. And for those Blacks in the North, those free Blacks in the North who believed that they didn't need to sort of involve themselves in the affairs of slaves because they were free, he called on them to travel to Southern states without free papers and see if they don't get jailed or sold as a slave. Now, Walker would have been the first to recognize the disparity of interests among Black communities in America, but he also believed that the continued existence of slavery posed a problem that all Blacks must work to alleviate. Now, along with these ideas, another key theme of the appeal is what he calls the pernicious influence of Christianity as practiced by whites in America. So Walker posited that historically, Christianity had only hurt Blacks because it was a Catholic priest, Bartolome de las Casas, who was among the first to recommend bringing African slaves to the New World. So instead of being a benevolent religion, Walker argued the way in which religion was and is conducted by Europeans and their descendants, one might believe it was a plan fabricated by themselves and devils to oppress African Americans. So instead of the true Christian religion, David Walker believed that avarice had taken over the country as evidenced by the fact that you saw growth of temperance and Sabbatarian societies throughout the North, for example, but still little attention paid to slavery by whites. So his arguments here are ones that were shared by many of his contemporaries, featured Black abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass, whose 1852 Fourth of July address articulates kind of some of these same arguments concerning religion that Walker shared in the appeal. That's the address where Frederick Douglass asked, what's the 4th of July and question whether African-Americans should celebrate it, right? Yes, exactly. Now, Walker sounds like he was a man who tried to unite black communities throughout the new United States, both as an African-American and as a devout Christian. Is this why historians have found Walker to be such an important messenger of anti-slavery? Well, Walker's abolitionist career was a short but significant one. He actually passed away just one year after publishing the appeal under what some believe to be suspicious circumstances, possibly poisoning. But in his five years as an activist, he played a number of different roles. So along with his participation in and founding of the Massachusetts General Colored Association, he served as one of three agents in Massachusetts for Freedom's Journal, the first African-American newspaper. As an agent, Walker worked to raise funds for the paper and to increase its subscription base. By the time he published the third edition of The Appeal in 1830, Freedom's Journal had folded, but former editor Samuel Cornish started The Rights of All, and Walker similarly called for Blacks to help circulate the paper and contribute to its success in any way possible. For his own work, for The Appeal, Walker used networks of sailors to distribute it throughout the South. One white sailor whom authorities in Charleston arrested in March of 1830 for distributing the appeal testified that while he was in Boston, a black man of, quote, decent appearance and very genteelly dressed came aboard his ship and said that he wanted him to bring a pack of pamphlets to Charleston for him and give them to any African-American that he met. So the black man who approached Smith was presumably Walker, and it makes sense that he was genteelly dressed because Walker owned a used clothing store. And Walker cautioned Smith to keep his actions unknown to other whites. Now, unfortunately for Smith, he was unable to do so and was sentenced to a year in prison. But Walker's strategy here of basically trying to spread his appeal throughout Southern society presaged the later campaign waged by the American Anti-Slavery Society to sort of inundate the South with abolitionist literature. And it's one of the things that kind of helped to harden the battle lines between abolitionists and defenders of slavery. Now, soon after Walker published his work, other Southern states took action to make sure that it stayed out of the hands of slaves. The appeal made its way to ports from Virginia to Louisiana, and white leaders confiscated it wherever they found copies. Because it showed up in Virginia, actually, in 1830, authorities at the time attributed a connection between Walker's writing and Nat Turner's 1831 uprising in Southampton, Virginia. This connection is unlikely. 
Now, when the appeal was printed, legislators in states such as Georgia and Louisiana became so alarmed that they enacted harsh new laws restricting Black literacy, including a ban on anti-slavery literature. Additionally, when the final edition of the work appeared in June of 1830, the mayor of Savannah wrote to Boston Mayor Harrison Gray Otis and demanded that Walker be stopped, to which Otis replied he really didn't have any power to do so. So Walker's kind of fury denunciation of American slaveholders in the appeal helped contribute to unified Southern opposition to abolition, and it would have long-term implications for the politics of slavery. So by pushing Southerners towards censoring and confiscating mail, which Northern whites would strongly object to as a violation of their constitutional liberties, Walker may have helped bring thousands of new activists to the movement. Finally, perhaps even more significant was his influence on white abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison. So Garrison had started his anti-slavery career as a colonizationist, right? An advocate of sending blacks back to Africa, and he believed in gradualism or gradual abolition. Yet by 1831, he was calling for immediate emancipation. Now, Garrison never did adopt Walker's belief that violence may be necessary to overthrow slavery, but Garrison did say that if his strategy of moral suasion did not convince masters to free their slaves, then it just might take the physical strength of slaves to accomplish that task. And Walker and Garrison also shared very similar rhetorical styles. So in the opening editorial to The Liberator, Garrison wrote that I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice, right? Garrison's language in that opening editorial is actually very similar to the rhetoric that Walker himself used in his own writings. His newfound insistence on immediate as opposed to gradual abolition strongly suggests the powerful influence that people such as Walker had on his thinking and on the sort of growth of abolitionism in general. Is there any historical evidence that tells us how African-Americans in the South received and responded to Walker's ideas? I mean, you just told us how one of the messengers tasked with bringing Walker's appeal to the South was arrested and that white Southerners were very hostile to its ideas. But do we know whether black communities in the South received and considered Walker's ideas? No, we don't have any evidence specifically of, you know, who was reading it what influence it had. All we know is that it made its way down there and very likely had a radicalizing effect on people, right? So when we think, for instance, of Frederick Douglass, right, and his account in his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass of when he first started to read and reading just sort of opening up his mind, we can sort of infer that Walker's appeal had a kind of similar effect on other slaves who were literate and who may have encountered his appeal, right? So we can sort of infer that this is something that might have just really kind of caught the attention of slaves and made them think, oh, you know, there are a number of free Blacks in the North who are literate and who have decent lifestyles. Maybe that's something that we can have, right? So we know from our explorations in the Doing History to the Revolution series that the American Revolution was a complicated event with complex ideas. Christopher, do you think there's a way for us to connect the revolution and its complex ideas with the more clear and consistent ideas about freedom and liberty that eventually led to the abolition of slavery in the United States? Or perhaps to even later movements for civil rights and equal status for all Americans? I've mentioned Jonathan Edwards' idea that freedom is necessary to practice virtue. For many of the revolutionaries, virtue was the central ingredient in the success of a republic. The idea of civic virtue, emphasized by political thinkers such as John Adams, said that for any republic to thrive, its citizens must be willing to sacrifice their own individual interests for the good of the whole. African Americans grasped onto this idea and consistently argued that if the revolution and the new nation were to be successful, citizens must end the practice of slaveholding. And even in later periods, when notions of civic virtue were abandoned by many in favor of sort of liberal self-interest, 
Black thinkers remained committed to the argument that Americans had to slough off their practices of racial oppression and the institution of slavery, or God would basically take his vengeance on the nation. So while the political thought of the revolutionary period is an incredibly complex topic, I believe that many Black thinkers and activists remain consistent in their belief in civic virtue, at least through the civil rights era of the 1960s. Christopher, as you've studied several African-Americans of the revolutionary era, what do you see as their most important contributions to the era, as well as to American ideas and ambitions of freedom? Well, I argued in the book that African-American activists in Massachusetts, including Phyllis Wheatley, Lemuel Haynes, Caesar Sarter, as well as others such as Prince Hall, represent the origins of American abolitionism. Many historians point to the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, organized in 1775 as the nation's first organized anti-slavery committee. Organized groups of Black activists, however, started working to end slavery years prior to the Pennsylvania group in 1773. Their petitioning efforts over the next year successfully pushed the Massachusetts General Court to pass a law banning the African slave trade, but this law was vetoed by the governor. Later on, the African Masonic Lodge's petition to the general court in 1788 would also push that body to finally ban citizens of Massachusetts from participating in the slave trade, and it instituted heavy fines for their doing so. Now, Blacks in the Revolutionary Era in Massachusetts pioneered tactics that would remain crucial to American abolitionism until the Civil War including forming anti-slavery societies, petitioning the government, and using the Jeremiad as sort of a rhetorical tool, right? This idea that unless Americans abolish slavery, God is going to sort of take out his wrath on the nation. Now, while their efforts during the revolutionary period were largely geared toward ending slavery at the local level, their ideas and strategies would be powerful influences on later activists, such as David Walker, Mariah Stewart, William Lloyd Garrison, and others. The fervor of the Great Awakening and the religious disputes it produced prepared colonists for their protests against Great Britain's imperial policies and helped them lay the groundwork for the fight against slavery. The Great Awakening encouraged many men and women, black and white, to convert to Christianity. And as these new converts worshipped in New England's congregational churches, they listened to and considered Calvinist ideas about the judgment of God and how virtue could not thrive under tyranny. In fact, in January 1773, a group of blacks in Boston ran with these Calvinist ideas and authored a petition to Governor Thomas Hutchinson and the Massachusetts General Court calling for the end of slavery. The petitioners asked, If God does not judge people based on their outward appearance, but by what's in their hearts, how can the Bay Colony use outward appearance as a reason to keep others in bondage? Further, they asked, if God believes that all virtuous Christians can be saved, how can the Bay Colony justify slavery? Slavery, after all, is a tyrannical system that by its nature inhibits enslaved Christians from developing and practicing their virtue. According to Christopher, These Calvinist-based ideas form the basis for the earliest concerted efforts to initiate an anti-slavery movement. And the way that early Black thinkers like Phyllis Wheatley, Caesar Sarter, and Lemuel Haynes use these ideas serves as evidence that some who lived through the American Revolution recognized and grappled with the same question that Edmund Morgan later called the central paradox of America. How can a society that fought for and claimed liberty and freedom as its founding principles justify and permit the practice of slavery. Over time, thinkers and social activists like David Walker built upon the ideas that Wheatley, Sarter, Haynes, and others developed during the American Revolution. In his 1829 appeal to the colored citizens of the world, Walker used arguments similar to those made by earlier black thinkers to remind African Americans that they were not inferior to whites and that they possessed the power to resist slavery through education and collective communal action. In fact, Black revolutionary ideas have played an important and lasting role in the history of the United States. They helped lay the foundation of anti-slavery and abolition thought during the 19th century, and they even served a role in the development of the ideas and tactics used during the civil rights movement in the 1960s. 
Which brings us back to the question we asked at the start of this episode. Was the American Revolution's idea of freedom dependent on slavery? As it turns out, many African and African Americans who lived through the revolution and fought for American independence didn't think so. In their minds, as well as in the minds of others who followed in their footsteps, the revolution's idea of freedom was always meant to be more. For more information about Christopher, his book To Plead Our Own Cause, and for notes about the people and ideas we talked about today, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 166. As with all episodes in the Doing History to the Revolution series, there is bonus content that will allow you to take your exploration of the ideas we talked about today even further. All this content is available for free in the OI Reader app. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI Reader or your favorite app store to download the app. Karen Wolf, my co-producer on episode 160, The Politics of Tea, also co-produced this episode. Karen, thank you for all of your ideas and for your assistance in creating this episode. You know, come to think of it, I really want to thank everyone on the Doing History team for their help with this series. Karen Wolf, Joe Edelman, Rob Parkinson, and Martha Howard all helped me plan the episodes you heard in this series. Thank you, Karen, Joe, Rob, and Martha for all your hard work. And Martha, thanks for helping me think through all the different sounds I wanted to use in these episodes. I also want to thank Kim Foley, Holly White, and Laurel Dane for all the bonus content they created for this series in the OI Reader app. It's really amazing work. Thank you so much, Kim, Holly, and Laurel. And if you haven't seen their amazing work yet, don't forget to check it out. Next week, we'll return to our regular interview-driven episodes. And I think you're really going to enjoy the episodes we have planned for 2018, because most of them come directly from your requests. Finally, what do you make of the central paradox of American history? Do you think the revolution's idea and conception of freedom was dependent on slavery? This is a question many generations of Americans have debated, and one that historians still debate today. So I'd love to know what you think. Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet them to me, at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History series are productions of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.